Good afternoon. I don't want us to lose another minute of our time together, so let's commence. Well, welcome. I'm Merit Jane O'Dean of the School of International Affairs, and it's, a, it's really an enormous pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. I see many friends. I even see some former students. And it's really terrific uh, to have you here. You know, for more than 50 years, the International Fellows Program has given uh, graduate students at Columbia a unique lens on the world, uh, an opportunity to uh, study uh, change in international politics and foreign policy in a very interdisciplinary fashion um, and really to develop also practical skills um, with a, a remarkable group of dedicated public policy professionals as part of the network of the International Fellows uh, Program that every student in the program has access to experiences and carries with them uh, throughout their lives. Uh, today is a special celebration. It's a celebration of the continued revitalization of the program. And so we're particularly honored to have those who've been involved with helping to rejuvenate the program as well as those who lead uh, the program and so many alumni of the program. So it's really a fantastic uh, uh, gathering. Um, I want to also acknowledge the leadership and remarkable uh, work of Steve Sistanovich, who is the director of the International Fellows uh, Program, and, uh, and, and uh, his role in organizing this afternoon's uh, panel discussion. Really, this symposium comes uh, at a hugely significant moment in Russia, European, and U.S. affairs, the subject of this afternoon's discussion. Uh, it's obviously a period of geopolitical conflict uh, with respect to Russia and the Ukraine with great worries about what happens next. Uh, certainly, I'm very worried. Um, and I think this afternoon's discussion will shed some light on that and what we might expect uh, going forward and how we should think about it. Um, it's against this uh, backdrop that it's an enormous pleasure for me to welcome Strobe Talbot, president of the Brookings Institution, where he's been president uh, uh, since 2002, to give the keynote address. And I know that he's here with his new bride, Barbara, uh, just shortly after they've had um, uh, their honeymoon, and I thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much indeed. Strobe has had an amazing uh, career. Uh, prior to service at Brookings, you know, he was the founding director of the Yale School, uh, Yale Center uh, for the Study of Globalization. Um, you know, that word is now used uh, a lot. Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, but when Yale created the center, it was still, I think, uh, 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 just gaining sort of a currency in people's minds. So it was a, it was a really important initiative. And he served at the State Department from 93 to 2001, first as ambassador at large and special advisor to the Secretary of State for the new independent states and then as deputy secretary uh, for seven years. But he entered the government already really as a, a world known figure for his writing and his wisdom and his knowledge that was expressing itself at Time Magazine where he covered Eastern Europe, the State Department and the White House and then as the Washington Bureau Chief, editor at large and foreign affairs columnist. He's been widely recognized through awards and many other uh, recognitions, including the Edward Wayne Tell Prize for Distinguished Diplomatic Reporting. A graduate of Oxford and Yale with numerous honorary degrees, and I think um, if my information is correct, he's been awarded state orders from nine jurisdictions. I think that's really remarkable. So at a busy, moment in his life and at a critical moment, I think, in U.S.-Russia uh, relations. Uh, we're very, very grateful you made time to join us. Thank you very much, Strobe. Thank you, Merritt. I guess the first thing I should say is the honeymoon's over, <laughs> which, which I guess might, all, might also um, apply to, uh, to the topic. Um, I've had a, 
<laughs> no, not, not, that, not, not that topic, Barbara. <laughs> I'm talking about U.S.-Russian relations. That's what we're here to talk about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I have a, a number of reasons to be glad that you've given me this opportunity, not least because uh, SEPA is an, an outfit that I've had a chance to benefit from at least vicariously over the years and I've been here on a couple of occasions. And I suspect a number of you know my uh, colleague Kamal Dervish who's on the visiting faculty here. And, uh, and it's, but, uh, it's particularly uh, an appealing invitation not just because the topic is something that I've spent or misspent an awful lot of my life uh, thinking about, but because Columbia has, in at least two respects, uh, figured very positively and memorably in my own experience. I'm thinking here about uh, a event that took place uh, a little more than 40 years ago and another event that took place a little less than 20 years ago. In uh, 1974, um, I uh, was involved uh, in a project to bring the Khrushchev memoirs uh, to, the, uh, to the West and in the English language. And there had been some controversy about the provenance of those uh, memoirs when uh, they first appeared when Khrushchev was still alive. Uh, there were uh, basically two theories. One that the KGB had uh, falsified them, the other was that the CIA had falsified them. <laughs> well, maybe there was a joint venture uh, in there too. <laughs> but um, Marshall Shulman uh, sensed from the very beginning that they were the real thing. And when the second volume came out after Nikita Khrushchev passed on, uh, we were less constrained in what we could say about the material on which the English memoirs were uh, based, uh, namely on uh, recording tapes, 190 hours of them, which could be voice printed and authenticated uh, that way. And Marshall and Colette, his wife, who is here this afternoon, uh, put together a uh, uh, a uh, conference that brought some of the skeptics and uh, a, a number of the leading figures in the field to study uh, the uh, memoirs in their original and it was uh, very, very useful and some of the records of that uh, I think are, going worth, are worth going back to uh, today for reasons that uh, we'll be touching upon uh, here. And then uh, in 1996, uh, which was towards the end of the first uh, Clinton term, uh, I came up uh, to the Harriman uh, Institute to uh, sit down with uh, a very notable group of people, in fact, quite an in intimidating uh, guest list, to talk about uh, certain aspects of the Clinton administration's foreign policy with regard to Russia, in particular, of course, the expansion of NATO, which I suspect will come up in the course of at least the panel discussion uh, here. Uh, and it was uh, a bracing experience uh, for me because uh, as, I was, as I looked out, kind of as I'm looking out at you, I saw George Kennan and Anatoly Dobrynin, uh, both of whom had fairly strong views that were not in support of administration uh, policy. Uh, but uh, uh, they were arguments that I think resonate particularly in the current debate, and I'm going to not uh, emphasize that issue here uh, precisely because I know that uh, uh, Kim and others, and I suspect uh, Maxime, and who knows, maybe even Steve Sestanovich will raise uh, in the conversation that is about to uh, begin. And the, the other reason that I'm here is because Steve asked me to be here. Um, I'll do just about anything as long as it's legal and even then if I can get a good lawyer, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd still uh, answer uh, his call because he has been not just a friend and a colleague but uh, a true uh, guru of mine 
Uh, and mat matter of fact, I went back and read the text of the State Department approved speech that I gave in 1996, and I actually uh, quoted from Steve's uh, recent article in The National Interest. You remember this in 1996? He didn't know, but he was already in our sights to be brought into the uh, State Department uh, within about uh, four months of that. Uh, and a very good article it was, and still is, as is his uh, follow-up, which just came out uh, in the American interest. So let me get down uh, to business. Uh, I think everybody here would agree that the relationship between the United States and the Russian Federation, or let me just say Russia, uh, is much more like what it was 40 years ago when uh, Marshall uh, convened us to talk about the Khrushchev memoirs than it is like 20 years ago. That tells you a lot right there. Now the uh, proximate cause, and certainly uh, the most uh, treacherously cons uh, consequential cause of the deterioration of the relationship is, of course, uh, Ukraine and all uh, that that means. But I think that the crisis and the threat are much, much broader than that. Uh, I, I think that what we are seeing going on in Russia and between Russia and the outside world is a genuine menace to the chances of the 21st century uh, being one of prosperity uh, and peace. And I am not entirely sure that this is sufficiently and widely enough uh, understood. I have a sense, and others will, in the course of the conversation, uh, correct me if they have a different sense, that uh, we're getting a little bit too used to the crisis, and therefore not thinking of it so much as a crisis as what, what I would call a, uh, a new normal. We're beginning kind of to adjust to it, almost take it for granted. Uh, I've been watching the way in which the New York Times, which over uh, the course of the last year and a half has done a superb job, I would say a uniquely superb job, has been dealing with the subject of Ukraine. And the answer is not a whole lot. There's a kind of a humd humdrum quality uh, to the reporting and that tends to be back on something like uh, page uh, A14. Now, there have been a couple of uh, exceptions to that, like a very, very good lead editorial uh, in yesterday's uh, New York Times, which I, I recommend to you. Uh, but I think it was a little more typical that today there was a teaser on the front page of the New York Times calling attention to an article about Putin giving his uh, its morning in Russia uh, speech uh, and kind of uh, trying to put the best face on, uh, on how normal and positive and upbeat the news is on the, on the Russian economy. Now, I think the fact that this uh, issue is getting both not enough attention and a little bit too credulous attention vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what's actually being said in Russia and what Russia is doing is bad news on a number of different accounts. One is that it is not a normal situation, and it must not be allowed uh, to drag on for too long because it is unstable and it is dangerous. Every single day, there are probes of different kinds on the part of the Russian military, intelligence, and political agencies to test uh, how serious the West is in pushing back against what is clearly a threat, not only uh, to uh, countries that are still in something of a strategic limbo, like Ukraine, but also to member states of the NATO alliance uh, itself. And rather recently, and this was the principal subject of the editorial in the Times yesterday, there is now also nuclear saber rattling, including directed at NATO 
And guess what that means? That means directed at Washington. It means directed against the, uh, at the president, the commander in chief uh, of the United States. So that's not so good. Uh, the diplomacy is not only at a dead end, it's worse than that. The diplomacy is being transparently and cynically used uh, by the diplomat in chief, who is also the commander in chief of the Russian Feder Federation, of President Putin, uh, to uh, practice a kind of um, hybrid warfare, you might say, uh, pretending to be looking for a compromise of some kind, but uh, actually on the ground in Ukraine and elsewhere taking steps that make clear that he will not accept anything uh, of, that could be called a compromise that doesn't allow Russia not only to have a sphere of influence in its own neighborhood, but to have a sphere of a domination. In addition to that, there is, for all intents and purposes, really no dialogue uh, going on, uh, at least at the highest levels. The dialogue, such as it was between Presidents Putin and Obama, never got very far, certainly since uh, the Ukraine crisis started. And while I think we should all be very glad, and Constanza will speak to this, I'm sure, on the, uh, on the panel, we're very, very lucky to have uh, Angela Merkel uh, as the leading political figure uh, and uh, statesperson uh, in Europe uh, right now, not least because she really understands uh, Putin. Not in the sense that uh, Germans use sometimes, what is it, uh, Putin Verstehr, uh, which means uh, sympathizing, basically, or empathizing with Putin. She is not an empathizer. She no understands, but uh, that dialogue, from all I uh, hear, uh, has also become extremely uh, sterile. Also, the phenomenon of uh, Putinism, which, by the way, I was interested to find out uh, was a, f a phrase coined by a, a quite prescient uh, Bill Sapphire in the in 2000. I think it was it was it was either just before or just after Putin actually uh, won the March uh, elections back in 2000. And uh, the late Bill F S uh, Sapphire defined it in ways that are absolutely relevant uh, contemporaneously uh, now. And Putinism is contagious. I'll just give you three examples, and there I am afraid more. Uh, one is uh, Prime Minister Orban in, in Hungary. Another is uh, Erdogan uh, in Turkey. And while I'm sure that uh, Xi Jinping would not call himself a Putinist, I suspect, and other people uh, who have more reason uh, to know what they are suspecting, uh, believe that when President Putin was able to get away with the annexation of Crimea, uh, it was noticed in Beijing. And uh, the Xi Jinping uh, government had already distanced itself somewhat from the phrase, uh, China's uh, peaceful rise, uh, and is now on another attack that uh, uh, could uh, be uh, supported with the precedent of what uh, Putin has been able to do in his own uh, neighborhood. And then there is what the current uh, atmosphere and situation is doing to Putin's own uh, psychology. My sense is that he likes the new normal. Uh, he has reason, I think, by his own rationing to see this as a big bet that is paying off. And as a result, uh, this makes him cocky. And I think it uh, raises the chances that what I, we have already uh, have reason to see as one of his basic characteristics, which is a certain degree of recklessness, uh, might get him and us in very big trouble uh, together. Uh, he may overplay uh, his hand. Uh, and this is a very dangerous uh, game. Now, the flip side to his cockiness, if I can put it that way, is that there is a, a sense of the West being kind of dispirited, 
Uh, I think there's sort of crisis fatigue, there's sanction fatigue, uh, and as a result, there is uh, a little bit too much energy going into trying to understand what would, compromise, would, would constitute a compromise with Putin, and from everything that I hear, uh, it sounds like such a compromise would in fact be uh, a, a big win for him and a long-term uh, losing proposition, particularly for uh, Russia's uh, immediate neighbors, but also uh, for the West uh, in general. Now, all of that is the situation right now, but it's uh, also casting a rather dark shadow uh, over uh, the future. Am I right that this is the Hammarskjöld room? Yes? Um, let me channel uh, Hammarskjöld. Yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, now we know. <laughs> um, Dag Hammarskjöld was a uh, prophet and a practitioner uh, in the field of trying to mold international relations in a way that would allow us eventually to have something really, that, that would really meet the definition of a global governance. Now, it was impossible for him to advance that cause very far uh, because of the Cold War. And it's a tragic irony that he ended up being a martyr uh, of the Cold War uh, since his uh, plane went down in Congo Katanga uh, as a result of his efforts to bring peace to what was essentially a proxy a conflict associated uh, with the uh, Cold War. And for another 25 years uh, after his uh, death, the Cold War uh, persisted. But then something extraordinary happened, and we all know what it was. And it happened largely because of a Soviet leader. It was not so much the result of American and Western policy, although we can talk about ways in which that might have helped. It was because of extraordinary reformist tendencies that were unleashed first in the Soviet leadership and then elsewhere uh, in the Soviet uh, Union. And we know where that led. It led to 25 years, 25 years where we could call the era the post-Cold War era. And there was a lot of, of bad stuff that didn't happen during that time that could have happened otherwise, and there were good things that had great promise to them. I'm thinking here of the relationship that developed between the former Soviet states, Russia included, and the European Union, uh, bringing security and peace uh, to, the, uh, to the Balkans, uh, I don't think there is any doubt that if it weren't for the diplomacy and political bravery of President Yeltsin and Viktor Chernomyrdin, there would have been a land war uh, in Serb Serbia uh, at the end of the Kosovo conflict, but that was averted because of Russia's role. Uh, the OSCE uh, took on uh, real responsibilities and had some, uh, uh, some real uh, lasting effects. Uh, the non-proliferation agenda uh, benefited, particularly with regard uh, to uh, Iran. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there was uh, the creation of the G8 and the G20, both of which were seen as a way of giving Russia uh, a seat, as it were, at the table of the board of directors uh, of the world. And then last but not least, there was the NATO-Russia uh, relationship and particularly a partnership for peace a phrase that has a certain anachronistic and rather sad uh, ring to it now, since there is zero partnership and not much peace, uh, particularly if you're living uh, in uh, and around uh, Ukraine. So um, we'll talk about this more, I'm sure, in the panel. Um, I just wanted to uh, touch upon what I think is another aspect of the phenomenon that we're dealing with that is not getting enough attention either here or uh, in Russia. And that is that Putin uh, is responsible for Russia, if I can put it this way, breaking bad, but in a way 
that is deeply dangerous uh, for Russia uh, itself. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is that if you, if you really just kind of uh, deconstruct Putinism on what it means in terms of the uh, basic domestic policies uh, of the Kremlin and, the, uh, and the, the behavior of Russia beyond its own borders, uh, it's essentially the same poison that poisoned the USSR. Uh, and I'm, here I'm talking about, it has, the terminology has changed. It's now we, we talk about the vertical of power rather than the dictatorship of the proletariat, which was also kind of something of a fantasy itself. Uh, instead of rule of law, you have the word proizvol coming back. That's a word that translates rough, roughly into English as uh, arbitrariness, but it's, uh, it's much more hard-edged uh, than that. Uh, kleptocracy, corruption, the big lie, uh, the squeeze on civil society, the monopoly of the press, uh, the resort to murder of political and journalistic uh, opponents, uh, and of course uh, bullying uh, the near abroad uh, on the principle that uh, Russia ultimately wants to have each of its neighbors in one of two categories, either a vassal state or a basket case. And that's an essentially the, uh, the deal, as it were, or the proposition that uh, Putin is putting to President Poroshenko uh, now. Um, I think for those reasons alone, there is every reason to believe that Russia could go the way of the USSR, uh, which is to say it is simply not adopting policies either in its inter international relations or in particularly in the economy that is going to allow it to prosper as a truly modern state uh, in a 21st century globalized uh, economy. There is, however, one more factor that is different from the Soviet period, and that has to do with ideology. The ideology of the USSR uh, which was more uh, doctrine than deep-seated belief, perhaps, at least had the virtue of being internationalist. It was Marxism-Leninist, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 pro the proletariat of the world, and, and this is the vanguard of the proletariat of the world. What Putin has done by way of substituting a new ideology for the old ideology is blatant Russian chauvinism or nationalism. And when I say Russian, I mean Russian in a connotation that includes ethnicity, religion, culture, and language. And that strikes me as surpassingly uh, non-strategic and unwise when you have what is territorially by far the largest uh, state uh, on the planet. And yes, I don't know what Kim and others, what, what percentage you would do, but the, the non-Russian or non-Slavic population is somewhere around 20%. But that 20% uh, that is non-Russian uh, occupies more than 20% of this vast and very under, in many areas, very underpopulated uh, parts of the country. And to have a leader who is using this ideology is going to create a attractive nuisance for other forces. And here I am thinking particularly of extremist Islamic uh, forces to the south uh, of Russia. In other words, the Putin doctrine, which is that Russia has the right and obligation to protect its compatriots in Donetsk or Transnistria, or for that matter in Narva or Tartu, can be turned uh, right around. Uh, there are some wild and crazy guys with uh, beards and turbans uh, to the south of Russia who have already uh, declared that there is a Caucasus uh, caliphate. Uh, and they are asserting, as it were, uh, the right and obligation to protect their compatriots, their Islamic compatriots, uh, inside uh, the Russian, uh, in, the, in the soft underbelly uh, of the Russian Federation.
Which brings me uh, to one uh, particularly uh, telling uh, and I find incomprehensible example of Putin's uh, uh, grand strategy, and that is his relation uh, with uh, Ramzan uh, Kadyrov. Uh, and if you're not familiar with him, you can follow him on Twitter. Uh, it is, uh, he is at R. Kadyrov, uh, Kadyrov, and he has, as of today, uh, 178,000 uh, followers. And I'm sure he's following you, uh, Steve. Uh, what Putin is doing in Chechnya now is basically a Faustian bargain. Uh, the deal is Kadyrov, because it will help him uh, not just in Chechnya but in, uh, the, in the North Caucasus as a whole, has embraced uh, Islamism. And he is also Putin's designated uh, sheriff uh, for the region in keeping things under control there. How long will that last? Which way will uh, Kadyrov break uh, when the pressure really begins to mount on him uh, from the region uh, its, uh, itself? So I'm going to, uh, since uh, when Steve asked me to put a title uh, on uh, this talk, I foolishly said, well, why don't we use the famous Russian question, uh, what's to be done? So I guess I better say something about what's to be done. Uh, first. I would suggest uh, keeping on the sanctions and indeed increasing them uh, if there is not real, by our standards, positive uh, diplomacy that leads to a truly acceptable compromise over uh, Ukraine. Second, uh, beefing up NATO so that it is absolutely clear to the Kremlin, including uh, some reckless people there, that uh, Article 5 of the NATO Treaty is uh, absolutely uh, the bottom line and don't cross it. Uh, three, uh, help the Ukrainians in every possible way, especially now that they are finally, after 90 years, uh, are actually beginning to institute uh, some real uh, reforms. And uh, didn't get much play, but uh, Natalia uh, Jurescu's uh, uh, various speeches in Washington last, in, in, the, in the last week. She is the, an American-born Ukrainian who was the finance minister. It was very, very compelling that this is not just the intention of the new government. They are actually uh, taking real strides. Uh, and then fourth, the what is to be done question should be answered with continued engagement with Russia. Now, that may sound a little bit at odds uh, with the, the other points that I was making. But I think it's uh, absolutely uh, essential because Putin is not Russia. He is by far the most uh, powerful leader in the Kremlin, Kremlin since Stalin. Because remember, all of the Soviet leaders after Stalin had a board of directors that they had to uh, report to. It was called the Politburo. And the Politburo uh, fired Khrushchev uh, and came close to firing uh, Gorbachev. Putin doesn't have a Politburo, but he is not an absolute di dictator, and I'm not sure he understands exactly what's going on in his country, and I don't pretend to myself, but this much I sense, and I'm sure it's uh, got a touch of uh, wishful thinking in it. And that is that uh, this is a much more globalized country uh, than it was 25 years ago, not to mention uh, 40 years ago. And that doesn't just mean uh, the very rich. Uh, I, I think the sanctions, uh, there was a piece in the Financial Times after the sanctions were imposed, that there was uh, a, a kind of collective uh, gasp in Moscow when the uh, price of a, of a cell phone in Moscow went up like, uh, like 60 percent. Uh, Russians want to be connected with the world. They want to do business in the world. If they're very rich, they want to have yachts on the Amalfi Coast. They want to send their kids to American and British uh, boarding schools. They want to have Swiss bank accounts, all of that. But there is also an incipient middle class. Uh, Maxime will have uh, his own observations to give us uh, on, on this question. And the youth, I think, uh, particularly in the big cities, which matter, uh, are, are even more globalized uh, than, uh, than their older generation. So the point there is that we, we must hope, and we must base our own policy on the hope, 
that Russia will itself, as was the case back in the 19, 1980s, as was it the case in the back in the 1980s, uh, see the rationale for real reform and real integration itself. Now, you can say, well, what happened back in the late 80s and early 90s didn't turn out so well. Is it inevitable that it would not turn out so well? Uh, or as uh, Steve puts it in the title of his latest article, uh, could it have been otherwise, question mark. Steve has a very sophisticated answer to that. I'll give you a very blunt one, which is, yes, it could have been otherwise. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I think it's important to, uh, to properly weight the factor of leadership. Uh, you know, there are all these questions about uh, that, that Russians like to kind of, or big issues that Russians like, Russians like to boil down into, into simple uh, phrases. Shtodielets, uh, what is to be done? Katokovo, who is going to, who is beating up whom? Uh, I think the really important question here is Katov Kremlin. Who's in the Kremlin? And when you had a reformer in the, in the Kremlin in the, per, in the last days of the Soviet Union, followed by a reformer in the Kremlin in the first days of the post-Soviet uh, Russian state, it really uh, mattered. Now, of course, there's another uh, fav favorite Russian phrase, which is Kotovinovat, which means who's to blame. And a lot of people say, well, uh, Steve and I are to blame, to, to some extent, for all the trouble, but that Yeltsin was to blame. I think the biggest blame that history is going to assign to Boris Yeltsin was his choice of Putin as his successor. Had he not uh, fallen into the trap of picking somebody who would have one ob obligation abo above all others, namely taking care of the lives and fortunes of the, of the uh, Yeltsin family. Had Boris Yeltsin, at the end of his presidency, uh, picked a reformer who in turn brought in uh, reformers around him, things might be different, can't prove it, but uh, it can't be uh, disproved uh, either. I think um, I'm going to conclude uh, having uh, channeled uh, Hammerschold uh, in uh, channeling uh, George Kennan, since it's still very much in my mind that I kind of think of him out there somewhere uh, looking skeptical. In 1947, when he wrote the, uh, the X article, uh, he had the following sentence, and I'm paraphrasing somewhat. Uh, the USSR, he said, was uh, displaying tendencies that must eventually find their outlet, either in the breakup or the gradual mellowing of Soviet power. The breakup or the gradual mellowing. And what happened, of course, was both. Uh, mellowing and breakup uh, in that order to be noted. I think the, the, uh, there's no question, uh, certainly in the time that, uh, well, pretty much every administration I can think of, the concept of containment in the 20th, 20th century was not to isolate the Russian, uh, the Soviet Union, or Russia as it then was, and not to consign Russia and the West to endless stalemate, but to give the Russians themselves time to get over Soviet communism and see its fatal flaws. And I think that the concept of 21st century containment, and let's call these things by their own name, is to give the Russians time to get over Putinism. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs>